Hello, I'm Robert Estrin. Some of you may know me from my videos, livingpianos.com and YouTube. You know, I get to connect with people who have a passion for the handmade American and European pianos that I grew up with. You see, my family are all musicians. I study with my father, Mort Nestrin, who's a concert pianist. My sister is a pianist as well. And I also got to study with some phenomenal concert pianists at the Manhattan School of Music, Indiana University, and as well as the Mozarteum in Salzburg, Austria. So I've been surrounded with great pianists and pianos my entire life. Now here we are, and uh, my wife and I are both musicians, and we have concerts right here in our Live Work loft. And downstairs, I've got all sorts of wonderful pianos. Here we perform many different concerts, including my Living Piano Historic concert experience with youngsters, prodigies I work with, and we perform workshops and all sorts of performances all over the region. You know, there are lots of piano stores out there, and the fact is, if you're looking for a high quality Asian production piano, you can go to countless stores throughout the country. But the number of American-made pianos has dwindled down to a tiny handful. And I've grown up with these pianos. I remember helping my father choose pianos for his New York recitals and recordings. And these instruments are quite rare today. The benefit of owning a handmade American or European top-tier piano is the fact that these instruments can last generations. More than that, since there's a limited number of them and the price of new pianos is so expensive with these handmade instruments, it pays to restore them. And you can enjoy a higher level of sound and touch on these instruments. I want you to consider me as a personal resource for any piano questions you may have, whether it's about pianos or about piano playing. And many of your questions will end up in future videos for other people to enjoy. If you have a piano and you're wondering if it's worth selling or restoring, feel free to contact me anytime. So thanks for joining me here. This is just an introduction. If you'd like more information, feel free to visit me on the website or feel free to contact me personally, Robert Estrin at livingpianos.com. livingpianos.com live YouTube event. Today's subject is technology's impact on music. Think about what we're doing here right now. It's pretty mind boggling that we can all share and connect all around the world in real time about piano playing and piano technique and music. And this is a wonderful thing. And this is just the tip of the iceberg. Technology has impacted everything for the way pianos are tuned to the way people study the piano with Skype lessons and other interactive types of learning experiences with music software. The whole recording industry has upended musicians' lives and how they're paid and the whole model as to what it means to be a musician in the 21st century is kind of the macro focus today. But I really want everybody to think of this as a general forum where you can ask any questions about piano playing or piano technology. And to get the ball rolling, we've got some questions that came in during the week for today. And I'm going to start with the first one, which is buying a piano at an auction. Do's and don'ts. All right. Buying pianos at auctions sounds like a great idea. And in fact, if you know a great deal about pianos, it can be a good place to get a deal. But here's the thing. Generally speaking, auctions don't give you the opportunity to really scrutinize a piano. Now, you may be lucky enough to have an auction that there's a, a pre-period where you can actually have a technician come in and assess the piano and so you know what you're getting. Otherwise, if you don't have a lot of knowledge or that opportunity, it's kind of if you're uh, averse to risk taking, that is probably not the right place to get a piano. More than that, auctions are tough because there might be, you know, 500 things at the auction and they start auctioning one by one and you're waiting all day long and finally they get to the one thing you're interested in and boom, somebody outbids you. The only way to really be effective at auctions is not only going to a lot of auctions, but being open to any good piano, not being particular about color, finish, brand, and things like that, then you have an excellent chance of picking up a deal. Otherwise, it could take you years to ever connect with the right piano that way. Good question though. Let's go to the next one here, the sustenuto pedal. Now, what's the sustenuto pedal? That's the middle pedal on the piano. And 
The question is how it works, how to use it, which composers or pieces call for its use. Well, truth be known, the middle pedal on pianos didn't come to be until nearly the 20th century, the beginning of the 20th century, so there's virtually no music written for it up until, you know, Debussy and a little bit before that because it didn't exist. Now, what does it do? If you have upright pianos, they do various things, but rarely what they're supposed to do. The middle pedal is a selective hold pedal. Now, I know if any of you have pianos, grand pianos with middle pedals, and you push and you go, it doesn't seem to do anything. Well, here's the trick to it. Try playing a chord, any chord. Let's say I'm gonna play a C major chord. While that chord is holding, before I let my hands up, I'm taking the middle pedal. Now those notes hold, but no other notes will hold. That's the trick. Now, how is this used? Most often times, a bass octave is held while other notes are happening. The cool thing is, you can use the middle pedal while also using the sustain pedal, the damper pedal on the right, for something along the lines of this. It's almost like having three hands, isn't it? Because you can hold something in one register of the piano while playing other notes. That's why, by the way, many upright pianos have bass sustain middle pedals that hold everything below the C, below middle C. That used to be pretty common in uprights. Today, most often you'll find practice pedals that mute the sound with felt between the hammers and the strings. All right, good question. Well, here's another one. Why are there more scales than keys? Really good question. Well, there's two answers to that question. One is that you can have major and minor scales. And there's the melodic minor also. You can even have modes. You can have all sorts of scales on each note. But there's another facet to this that's quite interesting. You might wonder, why the heck is there an F sharp major and a G flat major? It's exactly the same notes on the piano. The answer to that is when pieces modulate, that is change keys within the piece, sometimes it makes more sense if you're already in a sharp key to stay in sharp keys going to another key. So that case, you might want to call it F sharp major in a piece that's, let's say, in A major, because F sharp is the sixth note of the A major scale, and it's the relative minor. It would make much more sense to call it F sharp if a piece modulated to F sharp from A, rather than G flat. So that's why you have all these different scales. There's a ton of them out there. If you start getting into uh, you know, altered scales, and blues scales, and whole tone scales, and chromatic scales, Many different possibilities. And one more from this week. Arizona asks, how do you dust the inside of a piano? Well, you probably discovered that you can't really get in there, can you? Well, some people will try blowing it out with the opposite end of a vacuum cleaner, but boy, that can make a dusty mess in your home. Really, the only way to do it properly is to have your technician, your piano technician, will remove the keys and the entire action of a grand piano. It comes out as a unit. Then they have a tool to get underneath the strings, between that little gap between the strings and the soundboard. The reason why this is not a do-it-yourself operation is just removing the action. It's so easy to break off hammers if you've never done it before. And I can tell you, any piano technician out there, correct me if I'm wrong, every piano technician out there has at least the first time when they first started pulling actions, broke at least one hammer off a piano. I, I think it's inevitable. If you do it at the beginning, you're going to break at least a, a hammer one time, and you think you weren't not going to do it. But the, the problem is, when you're pulling the action out, if a key is down even a fraction of an inch, it'll get snapped right off. And it, it's so frustrating when that happens. So, Leave it to your technician. They're skilled and can do it nicely. All right, now we have some questions from viewers right now. Very exciting, I love to hear this. Nervous Wreck asks, question is, there ever a situation when you would use both the sustenuto pedal and the sustain pedal at the same time? Well, hey, I just answered that question. Absolutely. You know, um, Debussy, 
the Por Le Piano. You hear that A octave holding that whole time? Now, if I were to play that same thing, instead of using the sustenuto pedal, I was using the sustain pedal, the damper pedal on the right, it would become a blurry mess because to keep that low A octave down, I couldn't release the pedal and you'd end up with this. So you can hear it doesn't work. So in music that calls for the middle pedal, you really do I mean, don't absolutely need it, but it sure comes in handy. Now, if I had a piano, if I had to play a concert and I got there and there was no middle pedal and I had this piece programmed, I might do something like this with half pedal technique to kind of keep some of that A sustaining, but not so much that all those other notes become blurry. Let's see if I could pull that off. I'm not using the middle pedal now, but I'm gonna try to make it sound somewhat correct. than it was when I just put down the pedal uh, for the whole thing, but it's still not as good as that sound when you capture it on the middle pedal. Bijan asks, how do you work on hand independence as a beginner? As contrary to logic as it might sound, it's by practicing hands separately. How can this be? Well, the most difficult aspect of piano playing by far is the fact that you play hands together, independent parts. As a matter of fact, if that weren't the case, I would venture to say that the piano would probably be about the easiest instrument to play compared to any other instrument. But when you have different parts in each hand, that is a tremendous challenge. So when practicing, taking a very small chunk at a time, mastering the right hand, just one phrase, until it's memorized and secure, doing the same thing with the left hand, until it's absolutely, you can play it easily without even thinking about it, up to speed, even faster than tempo. Then go back, very slowly try the hands together because that's the hardest part. But at least if you have a handle on solving all the technical issues with hands separately, you have half a chance of getting the hands together with security. Okay, another question from Bijan is, how do I quicken the process and get better at assessing finding notes in the piano as a beginner? In other words, it takes me a minute to locate the notes. Well, I don't believe that for a minute because I know you, Bijan, and you're an accomplished pianist, but I like your question. How do you find the notes quickly? Well, you know what? I know I've sometimes seen pianos. We get pianos here at Living Pianos and sometimes where somebody is taped on, or worse yet, they've actually used an indelible marker on all the keys to mark what they are. You know what? It's really not that hard. Why? Because once you know one octave, they're all the same throughout the entire piano. And how do you figure out what note is what? Well, think about this. If the piano had no black keys, it would be an arduous task to figure out any note. You'd have to probably count from the bottom every single note until you got to a key to be sure of what it is. But because they're arranged in groups of two and three black keys, you always know that the key just to the left of the group of two is a C, and this is true in every single octave. Now, if you just learn a couple of notes like that, like F is the one just below the group of three, and guess what? It's alphabetical order from there. A, B, C, D, E, F, G. And then you go back to A, B, C. It's a repeated pattern. And while it might seem mind-boggling at first to look at all those keys, the 88 keys across the piano, you will very quickly learn your notes, provided you don't write them in on the keys. It won't take you long, I promise. All right, we got another one. Macaroni Media. All right, thank you, Macaroni. Good to have you here. And can you get a piano tune that has really dusty strings without them breaking? Oh, what a good question. And the answer is sometimes. Sometimes the rust might look bad, but it's superficial. Now, before you attempt to tune such a piano, you must get the right piano technician who knows 
what to do. There are different methods that different piano technicians have for tuning a piano with rusty strings. Now, if the strings are rusty, there's also a good chance the piano has been neglected, may not have been tuned in years, and in which case the whole pitch might be down. And when a tuner starts tuning all those strings up, they can start breaking like crazy. So one method is to lubricate all the points of friction, and there are a lot of them because you've got over 220 strings on most pianos, and there are several points of termination. What do I mean by points of termination? Basically, wherever the strings touch metal in the speaking length of the string, the part of the string that makes the sound, or even the parts that don't make a sound because when you tune it, it could impact that. Another method is to release the tension on each string first, which is a very important thing to do. Because if it's flat, you just go up. Well, if rust is accumulated right at that point at which the pin uh, meets the string, it could create uh, an, a situation where they might break, releasing the tension first. My advice is get a technician and ask them specifically, have you dealt with pianos that need a pitch raise and the strings are rusty? Do you know how to deal with that without breaking the strings? And if they say, I've dealt with that, but I can't promise they won't break, that's the answer you're looking for because you'll find out very quickly if the piano needs to be restrung in that case. Okay, Chris asks, discuss the pros and cons of hybrid pianos. I've been downsizing and gave my Boston grand trying to decide between a good upright and a hybrid. Hybrid pianos are the future of pianos to a great extent. Now, don't all of you cringe at once because there will always be pianos like this in the world. But as technology moves forward, we have already went through one really major technological change in pianos, which is the digital piano. When I was a child, digital pianos didn't exist. If you wanted a piano, it was a piano, period. You know, later there were electric pianos, but they didn't sound like a piano. They felt something like a piano, but they, you know, they had a bell-like tone, like a Fender Rhodes, a Wurlitzer Electric. Well, digital pianos changed all that. You could finally have something that sounds like a piano, 88 keys, even mimics the feel to one extent or another. Well, the next revolution that we are undergoing now is making the experience of playing a piano uh, where you don't have to have the entire action, soundboard, strings, and all of that in order to recreate a piano playing experience. Now, where are hybrid pianos ideal? Well, there are many situations where hybrid pianos offer the best solution. For example, any place that the climate is such that a traditional piano won't hold up. For example, uh, somebody who lives at the beach is tough for pianos. They're gonna rust out no matter what you do. Now, maybe if you live at the beach, you have the resources, you can have your piano restrung, you know, every 10 or 20 years or whatever it takes. Or you can keep it in an air-conditioned room if you don't mind not having that beautiful ocean breeze or whatever you've got <laughs> right outside your window. But hybrid pianos will hold their tuning. They don't have all the, the uh, changes of the weather that you are, the traditional pianos are susceptible to. Not only that, but the best hybrid pianos give you the sound of a concert grand like this in the space of a console. So there are many benefits to hybrid pianos. Now, are they as good as playing a concert grand? No, they aren't. But like digital pianos in general, they keep getting better. And at some point, dollar for dollar, they're going to be better for some people. And even in the state of the art, like the grand hybrid Casios are remarkable because they have Bechstein designed keys and sounds of Bechstein and other great pianos that can make a tremendous uh, playing experience for you. Not only that, but you can hook it right to headphones if you want or to computers for music education and music production. So there are many instances where a hybrid could be the right piano for you, but if you have the space, the budget, the, the climate for a traditional piano, it's still the ultimate experience if it's in great shape. Joe asks, thinking of the piano sound and the feel of the keys only, what's your favorite brand model of digital piano? Sound and the feel of the keys? You know, um, first of all, the technology changes so rapidly, I couldn't honestly say that I, that I am intimately familiar with the current state of the art of all piano brands out there, but I will say, Casio has been doing some great things with their Selviano and as I mentioned, their hybrid, grand hybrid series, 
Roland, Yamaha, Korg, Kawhi, all have things to offer. It depends to great extent what, the extent what you're after. If it's classical playing, very few pianos offer that kind of sound. In fact, a lot of times digital pianos are made for traveling musicians, and traveling musicians usually playing in a band environment. If you think about the sound you get in a rock band or even in a jazz ensemble, they are mic'd pianos, and that's the sound that these digital pianos reproduce. Um, so you have to think about what you like. Now what I like and what might be appropriate for your style of playing might not be the same thing. So I can't give a definitive answer, but the brands I just mentioned certainly are the top of the line. And uh, I really love the Grand Hybrid series for sound and touch because it does have a hammer action and the sound of three of the world's great pianos. All right, we got more. Boy, these questions are keeping me busy today. This is exactly what I had in mind for these uh, these presentations for you. Rusk asks, with QRS Piano Scan MIDI, how much how much do you recommend silencing a grand piano entirely in order to use a grand as a silent MIDI controller? Any other options besides the grand muffler system? Yes, the grand muffler system is ideal in one respect. It lessens the volume just like the middle pedal on modern uprights by putting felt between the hammers and the strings, lessening the sound, but not totally silencing it. But there is the um, there are silence rail systems that a number of companies offer. Uh, of course, QRS and Pianodisc both offer, offer them, but there's some other companies as well. And what they do is they have a stop bar that the hammer doesn't have its full travel, so it just misses the strings by a tiny amount. Now this is great because you have truly silent playing other than a little bit of mechanical noise of the action. However, because the hammer stopped just short of the strings, then you're still not gonna get exactly the same feel. It's incredibly close. So the regulation when the bar is engaged is gonna be different from the regulation when it's not engaged. Makes sense, doesn't it? Now Yamaha does have technology in their pianos, their silent pianos, factory installed. This is not an aftermarket, but if you buy a brand new Yamaha, it actually, the action moves such that there is no change in the touch with and without the silent system. There might be some other silent systems on the market that offer that technology. And if any of you technicians out there know of that, please put it in the comments to share with everyone. Robert asks, you use less arm weight when playing soft on the piano and more arm weight when playing loudly? Or do you keep arm weight the same, but the touch different? Great question. The arm weight definitely is different when playing loud and soft. For example, um, if I was playing, or if you were to play a slow melody that has to sustain a long time, even in a quiet context, like the Chopin Nocturne, uh, pardon me, or a Chopin Nocturne will work. How about the F sharp uh, major Nocturne? There's a tremendous amount of arm weight in this. Now, some of you who are not familiar with this whole idea of arm weight might wonder, what is this about and why do you want to use the weight of the arm? And the answer to that is very simple. The piano is one of the only instruments that doesn't have an analog to the human voice. Wind instruments obviously have the breath and the continuity of line. Bowed instruments, they have the benefit of the bow as the continuum of the tone. On the piano, how do you create a line that is convincing? If you try to calculate every note louder and louder and louder to the middle of a phrase and calculate every note from there softer and softer, you know what you're going to end up with? Calculated playing. <laughs> If you use the arm weight, increasing the arm weight as your volume goes up and decreasing as the volume goes down, you're gonna get a smoothness to your playing that is not available any other way. Now the problem is if you try to play something fast, like even the middle of that same nocturne, if you try to use the same arm weight in that part, it would be impossible to support that kind of weight when you're going faster. In fact, the rule of thumb is this. The faster you play, the less arm weight. 
until when you're playing very rapidly, it's almost like you're floating over the keys, precisely over them, so the minimal amount of finger motion results in the sound of the piano. So you can't possibly support, you know, like playing six scales slowly to develop the independence of your hands, you may have been trained to play with raised fingers to be able to stretch and have the independence of each finger on the keys. So that's a great way to develop you know, independence and strength of the fingers. But if, if you try to play a scale fast with that same technique and arm weight, it doesn't work. You, of course, have to lighten up. And once you play faster and lighter, you'll so it'll be like a light bulb will go off in your head to go, of course, this makes sense. How does a piano get refurbished, Jay asks. Well, that's a, a, a big question because it depends upon what it needs. Pianos don't wear evenly. There are three basic components of a piano. The finish, this piano, for example, um, was refinished because finishes can, you know, get old and crackly over time just from, you know, the sunlight filtering into a room. But sometimes the finish might be fine, but some, somebody has practiced a lot on a piano or it's been in a school and it's worn out. And the action needs to be either uh, re-regulated or even parts might be replaced, worn parts. And then there's the strings. Maybe the strings are okay. Maybe the bass strings need to be replaced. It's possible you can get new life out of the bass strings by simply twisting them. So refurbishing encompasses many, many different techniques. But the basic uh, determination of refurbishing versus rebuilding Rebuilding usually involves taking the strings off and having the entire frame of the piano, the cast iron plate, lifted out to get to the belly of the piano. That is, the soundboard, the bridges, to really work, and possibly the pin block, to really work the piano and make it like new again. The action, once again, is a separate component. Sometimes you can rebuild a piano, but the action is barely used, but there are cracks in the soundboard that can only be addressed by rebuilding. All right, the second question from Jay. What is your opinion on music played by AI? Do you think it will com compromise the beauty of music? You know, of course, we all want to believe that computers can't possibly do what we do creatively because while you can see robotics in factories and warehouses and even self-driving cars, you think, oh, music though? That takes a certain magical spirit that only humans have. To which I say, ha! Now, why do I say that? I might offend people. Because just look at the way things are going. I mean, do you really think that, that computers aren't gonna be able to consolidate the human experience at some point in the future? Will that be in the next 10 years? Maybe. Will it be in our lifetimes? Maybe not. We don't know when, but there will be a point at which, which AI will be able to create music that is compelling and create stories and art and all the rest of it. As a matter of fact, if you look at the current state of state of the art, there's a Google, uh, I'll, I'll put the link in after this video is done in the bottom. Google has this technology which creates pretty amazing music uh, out of thin air with their AI. Now, of course, it doesn't have the magic of the great composers, but technology keeps marching on and just wait. And I'm sure there will be things that will come about that are generated by computers. Now, that may seem like a scary thought until you realize that computers are programmed by people. So it's not like this is some machine. Machines have to have that human input. So really, it's kind of like a superhuman intelligence. AI is coming to that. That's a whole other story for another time. And some of you may have very strong feelings about it, but it's inevitable and it keeps marching on. So I'm not, I won't be surprised when there are some great musical compositions created by AI. I believe it will happen eventually. And then we have Fiery Coyote asking, what should I do if my piano is very bright and loud? It is very difficult to play softly. What do you think the best fix is? Well, the best fix is to get a great piano technician who knows how to voice a piano. Um, now it's possible that the hammers are worn out and in which case there's not enough felt and you're hitting wood against the strings and the only way to get that warm sound 
is to get a new set of hammers and the right set of hammers and have them those voiced for you. But you can look on your piano. You can welcome to email us if you take pictures through the strings while holding some keys down so we can see what the hammers look like and give, give you a clue whether there's felt to work with. A skilled technician can reshape the hammers back to that egg shape because over time your hammers get grooved where they impact the strings and that's hard felt and they can even get flattened out which gives not a very good tone to the piano by reshaping and get, getting back down to virgin felt if there's enough to work with and then needling the felt to soften it going across the keyboard, you, can be, you wouldn't believe the change of tone that is possible on some pianos without having to replace the hammers. Hopefully you're lucky and that's the case with your piano. Okay, uh, Sam asks, other than piano knowledge and skill, what is the most important quality for piano teachers? You know, for teaching in general, it's a matter of teaching the person, not the subject. You don't teach at someone. It's not like you have a lesson all planned and you go in and you just give it. You've got to listen to the student. Find out more about them. What is their week like at home? What is their practicing situation? Are there people in the next room watching TV telling them to shut up? You know, this might sound harsh, but you know what? This happens. You have to find out what, how music figures in their lives. So it's not just a matter you know, of, of teaching a certain prescribed lesson that everybody gets. It's finding the unique way of reaching each and every person. And the interesting thing is, piano comprises so many different skill sets that some people might be naturally gifted in rhythm where they can just instantly grasp very intricate rhythms, three against two and dotted rhythms and all sorts of rhythms and be really, you know, almost tone deaf with pitch and have difficulty carving out melodies and distinguishing lines in music. Somebody else might memorize very quickly, but be a terrible sight reader. So you have to teach, you know, the way that a certain person, what skills they have, enhancing their strengths and filling in their weaknesses. Fiery, Coy Fiery Coyote again, back with, I have a Yamaha disc clavier. What do you think the future of the player piano will be? Do you think the player will still exist in the future, or do you think they will just be high quality recordings? No, I, I think player piano technology is here to stay. You know, it's interesting that the roots of player piano technology go way back to the 1800s with the Vorsetzer. The Vorsetzer was a big apparatus that would slide in front of the piano with 88 little fingers that would play the piano. And better than that, it took the performances of great pianists in the early player pianos of the early 20th century when the player piano was king, when you know everybody had pianos in their homes and mostly player pianos. This technology offers awesome possibilities. For example, being able to hear yourself play the piano in a concert hall. Wouldn't that be great if you could actually play a concert, go back later into the hall, or maybe you just get to try out a piano in a hall play it on a reproducing piano, press the play button and walk around the hall and see how your performance is projecting in the hall, in the balcony, in the, in the orchestra section. Not only that, but you can have live concerts for the whole world to hear by playing and anybody who's got a player piano, then their piano can play the performance live. Spirio System by Steinway is actually resurrecting audio recordings of some of the great pianists and digitizing them to play on Steinways. That's an exciting development, isn't it? So I, I think that player piano technology is something to watch out for. Piano Disc and QRS are doing amazing things, uh, being able to share music, virtual lessons on a level that is not possible just with Skype. So yes, this is a growth industry for sure. And Russ asks, I have a hybrid grand from Yamaha. The concern I have is that eventually electronic parts and onboard sounds will become obsolete. Is this a reasonable concern? Well, one part of it is definitely a reasonable concern, which is eventually technology ages out. You know, we all hate to think about when you go out and buy a shiny new device, whether it be a computer, a phone, or even a digital piano, that eventually it's not gonna be supported when a certain circuit board goes out or key contacts get corroded. 
that they're not going to support every single model forever. So in that regard, yes. But here's the good news. If the piano still all the keys play, you can go out of the MIDI output, or if it's a more modern piano, the USB output, into a computer. And in the computer, then, you can have virtual pianos, either sample-based or like Piano Tech, a virtual piano that uses physical modeling. And you can expand the sound set so you don't have to be stuck with the sounds that are in your piano. You can have a world's worth of sounds available to you. So as long as your keys are still working, you should be in good shape. And second question from Russ is, what new technologies are you intrigued about? And hearing from industry insiders, anything that's wowed you recently? Well, there's a ton of things in the works, and I have many different things that I am working on and have a couple of prototypes of my virtual concert grand experience and some other exciting developments that you will be hearing more about. The industry at large, I mean, player piano technology keeps growing, and right now, in China, if you really want the answer to that question, you're gonna have it soon because Music China is the largest uh, trade show in the music industry on this. I don't know, they keep uh, the Music Messe in Germany. I'm not sure which is bigger now, but the Music China show is huge. And as a matter of fact, in regards to pianos, there are field houses full of pianos. I went there a couple of years ago and there were so many pianos to see, I couldn't even do a walkthrough past every piano there. So if you wanna know the future of pianos, China is the place with all kinds of new technologies with huge touch screens and collaboration. For example, being able to hear your students practicing in real time, like I talked about the player pianos. Well, it's possible now, and there are several companies in China working on this, where teachers can listen in real time to their students practicing at home and chat with them. So there are many, many exciting developments with, with pianos, and I'll have more information about that after Music China is over, and so be watching on our channel for that. Sir Switch says, how much should you practice trills until your third and fourth fingers gain some semblance of independence? Also, how do you figure out the root key when you're playing chromatic chord progressions? Well, the root key, that's an easy one. Uh, let me just make sure I remember this <laughs> first question before I go on to that. The third and fourth, yeah, developing strength, yeah, that's, that's a very good question. But as far as the key you're in is usually based upon the key signature. Now, in more complex music that's modulating all over the place, I use solfeggio. When I listen to something, it automatically goes into the syllables in movable do solfeggio. I have that, that tool. Beyond that, harmonic analysis of your music, if you know a lot about theory, you understand that chords are based upon the interval of the third. So you look for arranging inverted chords in root position in which everything is arranged in thirds. That is to say, skipping letters like F to A to C to E to G, every other letter. Then you know the root of each chord and you might be able to do a harmonic analysis. I bet you wish there was an easier answer than that, don't you? <laughs> but depending upon the complexity of the music, there may not be. So how much do you have to practice trills until you have enough strength? Whatever it takes. I mean, that sounds like a crazy answer, but everybody is different. Now, I grew up with my father, Morton Esther, who had so many talented students, and some of them could just naturally play double thirds like it was no problem at all. Did they just pick it up? And other people struggle and struggle for years and never develop good thirds. So your mileage may vary. Just stay with it until you uh, have the capability of being able to do it. You know, everybody is different, built differently, different hands, different capabilities. Um, starting young, of course, is a, gives you a heads up, and starting working on thirds at a young age, even if you're not going to play the double thirds etude of Chopin, start it, because it will only help you to develop the thirds earlier on. Aristocrat of Greed asks, hi Robert, bit of a long question, but given that some brilliant composers, musicians like Paganini and Rachmaninoff had physical abnormalities, long fingers, huge hands, etc., that made them able to do things that are extremely difficult or physically impossible for many people. What effect do you think that will be if the whole robotic hand industry makes so that even people with disabilities can easily conquer the physical aspects of playing such difficult pieces? Wow, that's quite a question. Well, if you're talking about robotic hands playing the piano, so for example, somebody with smaller hands could play 
I mean, I'm not sure the application you have in mind exactly with this, but um, one thing is just having smaller piano keyboards to play on, which aren't available generally. Um, there's, you know, PASC, which P-A-S as in Sam, K, PASC is the organization of our pianists with alternate size keyboards. And this is a, um, an organization I have a real passion for and look forward to working with in the future. We've talked somewhat about developing this and wouldn't it be great if there could be an action that could slide into any standard model D Steinway you're likely to find in a concert venue that has a keyboard that's slightly smaller. Now, if you practice on one of those all the time, then you have those robotic fingers you talked about playing a full-size piano, but I think that's a long ways off, frankly. But, you know, things are going faster than you might think. For example, they anticipate with the rollout of 5G technology, which doesn't suffer from the latency of our current mobile network, it would be possible, for example, a surgeon to do remote surgery with gloves on the other end that respond to every nuance of touch. So if there isn't a skilled surgeon, a brain surgeon, let's say, in a remote area of the world, as long as they have a 5G connection, a surgeon, a top-notch surgeon in a major metropolitan area may be able to, with virtual reality headset, see everything and feel everything and be able to do that. So if that's possible, it might be possible to play pianos remotely with such an apparatus. Good question. It's got to, getting me thinking about it. Okay, just a man is asking, is it common for vibrations to occur when the dampers are turned to the strings? A couple of bass notes on my new grand do this after one year. Well, you're lucky that it only happened after one year. That can happen on a brand new piano just from changes in the weather. You see, every moving part of the piano action, including the dampers, have felt bushings. The dampers have little rods and the rods are surrounded by felt. If it's humid where you are, the felt can absorb moisture and that can make the dampers hang up. And, and, and even just the exact seating of the felt on the strings has to be nuanced by a technician. And interestingly, I've been around pianos my whole life, have had that piano on, uh, that problem on many, many pianos. It's a concert when you have 40, 50 pianos like we do here at Living Pianos. There's always bound to be one piano in there that uh, a damper is releasing, you know, the note is holding a little longer than surrounding notes. And even though I've watched technicians perform, you know, the correction to this, dozens of times, countless times, it's never one thing. It's always something different. There's not one solution to that problem. So you really need a skilled technician. Check the humidity in your home. If it's more than, you know, in the 40 to 50% range, if it's typically 80, 90% or more, that could be your problem and having a room dehumidifier would be a great solution. The next best thing is having damp chaser technology or lifesaver system that puts heating rods inside your piano if necessary, as well as underneath, but still not as good as treating the room. Boy, we got a lot of questions today, huh? Uh, Steffi asks, in your opinion, why are the old square pianos considered inferior? You know, the square grands, I don't know how many of you have seen those. They look almost like coffins when they're closed. They're about seven feet wide. And the strings, instead of going this way across the piano, they go this way. So what that means is that the hammers, these keys on one side of the keyboard are really long to reach the bass strings and they get shorter and shorter and shorter to the treble. So the action is a nightmare. It can't possibly feel the same on the top to the bottom. So that's the main thing, the action is inferior. Worse yet, a restoring one, there are very few people who know how to restore them and can get their hands on the correct parts. And people just to service them is tough to find. It was really kind of a footnote in the history of the development of the piano. Good question, I appreciate that, Steffi. Now, Nervous Wreck, because come back again. Calm down, by the way. When looking for a piano teacher, are there certain formal qualifications that they must have, like degrees, diplomas, certificates? Do piano performance students take pedagogy courses? Two excellent questions. On the first one, absolutely not. Anybody can put a shingle up, 
this day and age, it's probably a digital single on Craigslist or Facebook and say, I'm a piano teacher and start accepting private students. There's no certification. I mean, there are different certifications in different areas like uh, certificate. Here we have the uh, MTAC, the Music Teachers Association of California. And some teachers uh, get certified. I'm a member and it's a great organization, but it doesn't mean that somebody who's a member of the organization is necessarily a great teacher. They must just have degrees and certain qualifications. That doesn't necessarily mean they're great teachers, which brings us to your second question. Do they teach piano pedagogy uh, as part of a performance, piano performance degree? And the answer to that is sometimes, but not always. And the degree that it's taught is, uh, is questionable even if it is covered. So piano teaching is one of those things that is largely unregulated. So you, the best way to, to find a teacher is to find students who study with a teacher, you know, listen to them and by referral. And the question to always ask, if you're looking for a teacher, let's say for yourself or your children, ask, do you teach how to practice? And listen to what they say. The more in depth and detailed the answer as to how the student is to practice, the, the more important. Because it doesn't matter what teacher you get, it's only gonna be one day a week in most circumstances, and that's just simply not enough time to learn how to play the piano. So a teacher who shows the student what to do on a daily basis through the week is going to be a far more effective teacher than one who just corrects mistakes, assigns new material in the lesson. We have another question here from Seif, who says, in your opinion, why are the old school, oh, though we, then we already covered that one. Okay, nervous wreck, but let's see, Bijan is back, all right. How do you control the dynamics of each figure to make certain notes and a voicing louder than others? Can you talk about your reaching theory? Yes, uh, you, you, took the, you took the words right out, of my, uh, right out of my mouth. There's a couple of ways you can do it. One is, yes, indeed, reaching for the notes that you want to bring out. So, for example, in the second movement of Beethoven's Pathetic Sonata, if you didn't want it to sound like this, all jumbled together, you can simply reach with your top fingers. practice finger independence is to play the line you want to bring out legato and play all other notes staccato so for example with this same same piece listen to this So with a very light finger staccato, you can play all the inner lines and play the line you want to bring out, legato. It trains your hand to differentiate between melody and harmony. Now in this particular piece, I would probably advise practicing both the top line, the soprano, and the bass, the bottom line, legato, so it becomes a duet with the inner line with a gentle finger staccato. you do this all without the pedal otherwise you don't even hear what's going on try that with any music you play playing the line you want to bring out legato and all of the notes with a gentle finger staccato and you won't believe how much that will help you to develop independence of the lines in your piano playing all right now this one is from c141988 asks should Steinway and other old time piano makers start making pianos mass production style for a high quality product for a low cost? Well, they already do. But the secret of course is 
Asian manufacturing. Unfortunately, it's virtually impossible to make a really inexpensive piano in a place like New York City, where Steinway produces pianos. Union labor costs are great. Uh, it's just virtually impossible. But Steinway has done something really smart in a marketing standpoint by subcontracting the production of pianos to Kauai and Pearl River, they offer lower line pianos from their Boston line and their Essex line that they don't actually build. They subcontract it out and they're able to offer these less expensive pianos. And yes, one's manufactured in Japan and the other in China. So this is already very common in the industry. But uh, being able to produce cheaper pianos here is a real challenge and maybe someday somebody will figure out how to do it. But so far, the cost of labor make it pro prohibitively expensive. And Jay asks, what catches your eye when you look at a piano score for the first time? Well, for example, let's say somebody puts a piece in front of me and say, could you play this? <laughs> time signature, key signature. Then scan the page, what is the fastest value of notes? Let's say you have a piece and, oh, this looks pretty easy, you start playing. <laughs> starts going to 16th notes, you go, oh my gosh, I should have looked further. The other thing, and I should have mentioned this first because this is perhaps even more important, <laughs> look for repeat signs and the capos and the signos, anything that makes you have to turn the page back, or worse yet, having to turn the page back twice, boy, that's going to be the hardest thing. For example, with sheet music, they always want to say paper. So they, sometimes it's like a road map with look for this sign, look for the double sign, and you go from this page to that page. And particularly, I've been called upon on many occasions to sight read for an audition or even, you know, in an informal or even a formal concert where I've been called upon at the last minute. And you better well know where that, where, where it continues when you get to the end of the page, where it goes back to. So those are all important things. And as I said, if it's just a piece that I want to play for myself, to get acquainted, the first thing, look at the key signature, look at the time signature, look for the fast, you know, later on, if there are changes in key signature or time signature, or changes in note value, you go from all eighth notes and quarter notes to sixteenths and triplets, you want to be kind of be ready for that ahead of time. All right. And then uh, Jay asks, how do you memorize a huge and difficult concerto? Well, a very small section at a time. This is the simple answer to that. And that's true of virtually any piece of music. I produced a video many, many years ago on how to memorize, and my father taught me that at my very first lesson when I was a very young child. And he taught that lesson to thousands of people, as have I, and has my, my sister, and many of my father's other students, which is, you don't try to learn a whole concerto. You just learn the first phrase just the right hand, mastering the notes, rhythm, fingering, phrasing, and expression, just in the first phrase, just the right hand, until it's solidly memorized. Then go to the left hand, the same section, learn the notes, count out the rhythm, look at the fingering, phrasing, the ways in which notes are connected or detached, expression, everything else. Get that memorized, Put the hands together, they get that secure. Go on to the next section, learning it the same way. As each section is mastered, connect from the beginning. And even a mammoth concerto. Now in a large concerto, you may consider learning uh, the cadenza first, or any particularly hard sections that you want to have a head start with. Because some sections of it are going to take you a lot longer to get up to performance level than others. So you don't want to wait till you're, you know, two thirds through the concerto to start working on the hardest section that might be in the last movement. All right? I hope that helps you. And Russ asks, how do you develop your ear to be able to determine if a piano is bright or mellow, dark or in the sweet spot in between? Well, just like everybody has a favorite color, there is no absolute to piano voicing. Some person might listen to a piano and go, oh, that's bright and harsh. And another person might just say, really? I think it's muddy, I want it brighter, you know? And it depends upon your taste. It also depends to a great extent on the style of music you're playing. 
A rock player might really want a brighter piano than somebody who plays, let's say, hymns. Um, so there's a lot to consider when, you know, piano tone. And there are no absolutes. The acoustics of the room, the style of the player. A stronger player, for example, the piano is going to be brighter than a player with less strength because that player with less strength is never going to hit the point at which that piano opens up to a brighter sound. So to each his own. You have to find the sweet spot for you in each piano. Nervous rap question again. Should the piano lid always be fully open when playing? When should you use half stick or quarter stick? Great question. Well, take a look here. I have the piano completely closed. You might wonder, why do I have the piano completely closed? Is this a normal way to play a piano? The answer to that is, no, it isn't. Normally, the piano is open at least with the, the fly lid, this front part, folded over, and it sounds just great that way. And really, for piano practice in your home, there's no reason to open the, the big stick unless you just like it, because you probably don't need that much volume. And that's the key. How much you open your piano comes down to the volume you want. Just folding it over might be fine. If you're playing for a whole big room and you want it to project, you could put it on the big stick. Maybe you're playing with a clarinetist and you're playing together and you put the piano open with a fly lid open and it's not quite loud enough. Then you go to the big stick and it's too loud. The balance isn't right. That's when that short stick, you ever notice? You ever wonder what that's for? The second stick, the shorter one, that's for when the open piano is too loud and the closed piano is too soft. Now, getting back to why this piano is closed. Well, the way we're working our live YouTube event, we only have one microphone and to make my voice balance with the piano, this is a nine foot concert grand, and it would be so loud that every time I play the piano, you'd have to turn your volume down <laughs> or every time I spoke, you'd have to turn your volume up. So we decided just to close the piano and you know what? This nine foot Baldwin has such a glorious sound. It can overcome even being closed, don't you think? <laughs> Boy, it's been really fun. And you know, I want you to think of these um, these as an opportunity to ask any kind of questions like you did today. We had a wide range of piano technology questions to piano maintenance questions to technical questions. Next time we're going to have a piano town hall next Thursday. Tune in and we're going to continue our discussion together and be thinking about questions and you can email them right here uh, to, uh, to livingpianos.com and we will address your questions in the next time we get together or even some other videos that we that are more involved questions that warrant complete separate videos for you. Anyway, thanks again for joining me. Robert Estrin here at livingpianos.com, your online piano store.